people talked about me like I was a dog, okay? Even though they're essential, that doesn't mean that they want to get sick. Housewives of Atlanta, Beverly Hills, Detroit, they don't have that. But you know what I'm saying? I could care less. It's that funny. So I'll just say, you're welcome. <laughs> Okay, I'm just wondering if you did your homework this week, because I gave you, I bullied you into some homework. And you know what? I really, really, in my heart of hearts, do not care to watch any of Housewives of Atlanta, Beverly Hills, Detroit. They don't have that. But you know what I'm saying? I could care less. But my mom and my sister love the show. You love the show. Y'all asked me to watch it. So I don't mind being on a pulse of what's going on and watching it. Unlike you with Tiger King, but I watched it. <laughs> I took the high road. <laughs> Way to take the high road. Now, I don't know. I don't know if we're calling that the high road, uh, but we are calling it a road because, you know, I am a huge Real Housewives of Atlanta fan. This week was history making in the Bravo atmosphere because it was the first virtual reunion. And I just wanted to kind of get your take on the reunion because I know that you're not really a housewives person. So what were your initial thoughts? Yo, like, are y'all, <laughs> are you guys serious? Like, oh, I mean, every other word, they were like, F you, B word, da da da. I'm like, Oh my God, like at first I thought reality shows, they're really acting and they don't, you know, they might get along afterwards. It's like, okay, good ratings. We're all getting a bigger check next season. But like these people are really coming for the jugular, calling out people's kids. Now, mind you, you marry somebody or have a kid with somebody who you obviously are attracted to. So if somebody says it looks like the dad, that should be okay. But obviously there was shades like, oh, it's looking like a man. That's somebody's child. That is somebody's child. Like what's the I, limit? I don't understand on that show. I understand. And I, I get what you're saying, because I think that there is two schools of thought. And I think we kind of represent both of them, especially as black women, because when you get to Real Housewives of Atlanta, people are like, we don't need to see that type of depiction of black women, you know, degrading other black women. And then on the other hand, I'm kind of like, OK, I see you. I feel you on that. And I don't, would never be like, yeah, let's advocate for the de degre degre de 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 degradation of black women. But I feel like we can be both because we are both. Like there is a spectrum of black women. And I think that we need to have the flexibility to be able to be a little, um, a little more hype from time to time and then show that side, but also show the side that, you know, we're presentable and respectable. So, okay, I wanna talk a little bit about the black woman thing. Cause one thing that struck me was when they all came at Eva for saying something about like a nappy comment. And mm -hmm. so Eva's thing was like, I'm black. I'm not gonna get scolded by anybody telling me about what I could say as a black person, which is like, I feel you, right? Like it doesn't matter because we don't know did Eva perm her hair? Is Eva's hair, I don't even like the word nappy, but is her hair the most coiled of all of them? Like, how do you know just because how she's looking now? Does she have contacts on? So we don't know what, you know, everybody's saying like the light skin, dark skin debate. I don't think that you should be saying, I think that if you're on a national platform, don't matter, TV show, news show, Real Housewives or whatever, you know you're being reported. Wash your mouth. Like, that's it. it does, it's not like all things I say to my sister, I will not say on, di on our show. On this show, on our well, TV of course show. not. See, I think it's deeper than that. Because, one, I understand that, okay, if you're a part of a community, then you do feel more um, emboldened or have the right to use certain jargon. However, when we're talking about, especially a comment about, it's really texturism. When we see a woman who doesn't have that type of texture, say something in a demeaning way about women who do it it it's gutting it hurts even more i don't even know if people were more angry or if they were hurt by it because it's like you should know better that's my and that's where this I, no matter where you fall in the argument i agree that you should definitely know better but i also felt like they were being and my, i called my mom because she watches the show often i said what did you think about it she said Lindsay, I just felt like this is the most crude, crass reunion of them all. They were being so rude. Yo, she said that Nikki, I mean, um, Nini looks like 
the men from white chicks. Like that's not okay. They said that that Eva's breasts are social distancing. That's rude. Like these are things that are very, very rude. So you know what I mean? What's a party foul? It's like, yo, it's just everything was a party foul. You know what I mean? Like, okay, I, I agree. I agree. But I think the reason why it got so gutter in a lot of respects is because it was a virtual reunion. I think it's a lot harder to say something like that to someone face to face when they're like six inches away from you. All right, I wanna to talk to you about something that you talked about to, with TI recently, essential workers. So I wanna tell you two stories that happened to me in one week, really quick. One, I went to Walmart, I bought a bike. This guy who was like the manager of that section of the store, super nice, blew up my tires, um, tightened my gears, did everything I, I needed without asking. He's an, an essential worker going out of his way, being super nice. Another, I went to the grocery store, I asked somebody where the pretzel bread is, and they're like, I don't know, like, you know, I just started here. And I'm like, Do you, can you get somebody who knows or, you know? So I'm trying to figure out like, and I understand why somebody would have an attitude about being essential workers, we can get into that. But you and TI had an entire conversation about the different things that are happening or maybe going on in an essential worker's mind. And I want you to kind of just talk to me about that a little bit. Well, yeah, I, first of all, I think that you're dealing with two different things here now because you can have an essential worker who was maybe doing something else yesterday. He might have been the accountant yesterday. He got laid off, furloughed, and now he's an essential worker because those are the establishments that are hiring right now. And a lot of people, I mean, over 33 million Americans are on unemployment and people have to get their hustle on. I mean, when I was on unemployment, I was selling t-shirts. You have to get creative when you have bills to pay, the bills do not stop. So maybe, yeah, the second person might have been doing something completely different and now they're trying to get their hustle on and they're just there like, you know, trying to make ends meet. But the thing is, that's the point. And that's what I talked about with T.I. on his podcast. All of the workers who were nameless, faceless people that we considered what? It was like we were living in some type of hierarchy in this country right. are Classic. now the yeah are now in the essential worker mm -hmm. category mm -hmm. and these people have been on the front lines mm -hmm. and they've been compromising themselves in order to continue to either provide services for the community as well as continue to provide for their families how is it that when bernie bernie sanders spoke of uh, the 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 essential the the uh, essential workers needing fifteen dollars bare minimum as an hourly as an hourly rate. The Republicans stood up and you know almost flipped over tables. And now these same people who you did not want to have at least fifteen dollars an hour are the very people who are providing your necessities and who are, you know, being, we're leaning on them. We're depending on them now. It's because people think of essential workers or they thought of them before being like on the front lines at fast food restaurants as like these 16 year old kids who are doing something for the summer in order to make some money for the school year. And we know very clearly now that that is not indicative of the demographic. It's like the pre-COVID conversation, the during COVID conversation. And then I'm curious to see what the conversation is post COVID because we need to keep the same energy for the essential workers moving forward. And that's the thing. I have seen people be so rude. I mean, to someone driving a cab, someone rude. To, even I think it's rude when you get an Uber and you're like, I want to not be spoken to. You know, these are human beings. Or when you get online and you're like cursing out the clerk at the, at, you know, at the register. And then I understand to me in that moment where he's like, I don't know where the pretzel is. He could also be the person who was taking all this rude treatment four weeks ago. And now because you guys need me, I know that anybody who was rude to me before they needed me, it's really not a conversation. I know that's me for regular, regular, regular life. People are people. They can only take so much. 
So it may not have been anything that you did, but maybe the past five customers have been really rude and arrogant to them. Like there's a whole lot going on. So I commend anybody who's continuing to show up because that's what's most important. We don't need service with a smile. We can't see the smiles anyway. We're wearing masks. <laughs> Doing your job is enough. We need to be nice to these people and listen to some of the plans put in place. And like you said, see what happens after this is done. If you go right. back to being your rude ass self, excuse my language, then something's wrong with you. All right, so you know I'm an Oprah fan girl. I think we both, hey. we both are. <laughs> and I, I, saw I Do we get here? Without her? Yeah. Um. <laughs> so there, she's doing a virtual tour of the Live Your Best Life thing that she just did with Weight Watchers that was around the world or around the country, I believe. She's doing it virtually for a couple of weeks. And I was so excited when I heard that because tons of other celebrities are also doing these virtual commencement speeches to all the grads who are not having that awesome opportunity to get somebody cool or important or smart to come speak to them before they go on and embark on this crazy life. I graduated in the middle of the financial crisis in 2009. Some people are graduating right now when most people are getting laid off. You know what I mean? We see that the highest number ever. So this is a crazy time. So I don't know if you're graduating or going through a tough thing, but I want to ask you because along the way, I've gotten some really, really awesome advice. So I wanted to ask you kind of what your best advice that you got. And it could be several things, but Tell me why and why it stuck with you and why you want other people to know this. Man, you know, I think, you know, my brand is the comeback. I believe everyone's deserving of the comeback they're willing to earn. Um, and I think that this is going to be such an interesting group of graduates to watch because I do believe that they are going to be a group of innovators and they are going to be troubleshooters because anytime you're thrown into the mix of everything ain't quite what it was promised to be, especially coming out of college where you've mounted up all of this student loan debt. And now you're like the people who I was looking to as mentors and advice may not have a job either. So what does that mean for me? And that means that you're going to have to come up with a whole new way of doing things. And there's no better time to do something like that, to really troubleshoot your life as to how you can best make the, the best impact on the world and yourself than when things aren't going right. It's not the time for panic. It's time to get to the drawing board to see what your unique gifts are and to look back on this time as all of us who have gone through hard times do and think, I am so appreciative of all of the things that made me dig deeper and work harder to get to where I am. When I was younger, I read The Alchemist and everybody references that book as something that is like a law almost if you're very encouraged to pursue your dreams. But some people who aren't at the stage where their dreams have come true, are not understanding how when you say, oh, the universe will conspire to give you what you want, how that is actually relevant to doing that. And for me, I just wanna say, taking the risk on yourself, obviously with planning, calculating risk, however you have to do it, when you are just have, having that much conviction that you want something so bad, it's true that the universe will work with you to make it happen. A lot of people were looking at me like I'm crazy when I moved to LA, I left MSNBC and had no job. And everybody was like, why? I'm like, because I know that if I want to do entertainment reporting and step out of news and be seen as somebody who's versatile, then I have to go to LA. Everything in New York and all the news directors trying to hire me want me to do local news. And I know from doing local news, knocking on somebody's door and telling them your neighbor died in a DUI is not something that I'm interested in doing for 10 years to get to the place of Robin Roberts. So I took a chance on myself and moved to LA and that's how I got my job at Revolt. But I got my job four days after I got there. And that's after Revolt shut me down about six times because they had budget cuts, things I found out after I started working there. And I just was like, it's not in the cards for me. But I let go of my ego, sent another email to Revolt when I got to LA, let them know if they need any help, even for a production assistant. I'm here. I'm not doing anything. I got time. Next thing I know, the supervising producer quit that week. And that Monday, that was on a Wednesday when I emailed that Monday, I was working in her role. <laughs>